grab your Bibles, open up to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Imagine these scenes. I want you to imagine, I don't don't think they're going to be very difficult to imagine. How many of you have ever heard, uh, or perhaps even said, maybe, you know, maybe, you know, I just did to him what he did to me. He deserved it. Or she did this to me. I'm just not going to sit there and take it. Or I got to let him know that he can't do that to you. We got to hit him where it hurts. Did you see what that girl posted about me? I'm going to get her. She doesn't believe what's coming. Mom, she hit me. Well, she pushed me. Well, she told me I was stupid. Well, she looked at me funny. Might not have heard that one in the Dyke's house. You never know. No. Pretty normal stuff, though, huh? Not some far-fetched examples of kind of crazy, evil behavior, but this is just kind of everyday human existence. Uh, you know, as, as we work our way continually through the Sermon on the Mount, we're going to get to, it, it's called the golden rule, right? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But there's kind of the opposite of that, which we really live in, and I couldn't really think of a good name for it, like the dirt rule or the rusty rule, but it's do unto others as they have done unto you. It's a rule of retaliation. So we're going to turn our attention. Today we're supposed to be on love your enemies. Uh, We didn't quite get there. We're on the retaliation section today. Uh, what does Jesus want to help us reframe our thinking around our personal relationships? And that's really the context of, of this teaching, right? Jesus is talking to disciples. You went back all the way in, in chapter 5, verse 1. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain and he sat down with his disciples. Uh, what does Jesus want us to know about these thoughts and actions that enter into our minds? So what we're going to see today, Jesus is going to remind us, and, and here's kind of your outline, of a wise rule right, that God gave us. He's going to give us a somewhat, I'm going to call it startling, update or interpretation of that rule. Then he's going to give us four practical examples. Uh, and then lastly, we'll, we'll try to bring it home with some applications and what do we do with this? I think you'll find, even as we've been, like all of these are challenging Anger, lust, divorce, like all of this is challenging, but I'll be honest, when you hit this one, it's like a different level. Let me pray for us, and we're going to jump in. Lord God, as we examine your word today, open our hearts and our minds and our ears. Plant your word down deep, God, that it may bear fruit 30, 60, 100-fold, Lord. God, don't... Don't let us sit here with our minds on other things and and just let these words bounce off our heads and and scatter, never to be really considered, God. Don't let them sink in just far enough to, to take a little bit of root, but then just all the mess that goes on in life out there, just burn them away, God. Look, don't let them be choked out by by all these false things that we can pursue and give our energy to, and then it just slowly just crushes the word, God, but let it find good soil in our hearts that it might bear much, much fruit in the life of our church and in the life outside. Pray at the name of Christ. Amen. So the passage today, Matthew chapter 5, I'm going to read verses 38 through 42. Jesus contends, continues with, you've heard it was said. You've heard it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you. And do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. 
Right, Jesus continues his teaching, or you've heard it was said, and he turns his attention really to retaliation, and he's referencing an Old Testament law, and we might as well just go ahead and, and kind of flip. If you want to flip back to Deuteronomy chapter 19, I'm going to read the verses just so you hear them. They'll be up on the screen. You don't, you don't have to necessarily flip back there. You can see them up there. But he's quoting Deuteronomy, and Deuteronomy 19, 20, 21 says, The rest shall hear and fear, and shall never again commit such evil among you. Your eye shall not take pity. It shall be life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Uh, so you can see, right, Jesus is, is quoting what we'll call for today God's wise rule that the punishment should fit the crime. That's what he's teaching here. That's the, the Old Testament law is that the punishment should fit the crime. We call it in, in our kind of legal vernacular, and it, it's called lex talionis. You ever heard that? It's Latin. Uh, it, it, that means, right, the law of retribution in kind, uh, or, or the law of retaliation. Uh, in kind means of, of the same nature, of, of the same intensity, uh, or of, of equal status. It really means that the punishment should fit the crime, that if the crime takes life, then, then life is, is what's given. If the crime takes an eye, it's an eye. It's a tooth for a tooth. It's, it's a hand for a hand. It's a foot for a foot. As we saw in our earlier examples, right, this law is needed because in our human nature, we always want to escalate it. I mean, imagine the situation, right, where, where kids are fighting, right? And it, it's, it is. It's one looked at the other one weirdly, and then that one got irritated and kind of shoved her, and then that one comes back and clocks them, and then the next thing you know, they're on the ground fighting, right? It's the way it is. It's not that different with adults. We just maybe do it a little differently, but it's the same thing. We retaliate. Uh, one of my one of my favorite movies. I'm going to date myself with this. Is uh, the Untouchables? You know, get un, get old, Sean Connery, right? Uh, Kevin Costner. Kevin Costner's character is Elliot Ness. He's trying to defeat Al Capone, and Sean Connery's character is uh, I think his last name is Connor, maybe uh, James James something. Uh, I should have written it down. Jim Malone. That's it. Jim Malone. Uh, and they're talking about how you beat Capone. And the old Irish cop looks at the young FBI agent. And he goes, "You want to beat Capone?" He pulls a knife, you pull a gun. He puts one of yours in the hospital, you put one of his in the morgue. That's the Chicago way. That's how you beat Capone. And it's like, that guy, that's the human way, right? We escalate, we retaliate. You got to get that last word in. I mean, you have to. Like, you ever done that, right? It's, it's an argument, and it's, there's a chance just to and turn around and walk away. And it's nope, right? It's just fire comes breathing out. It's hard to stop. It's hard. In our anger, in our rage, we do not respond in kind. Instead, we escalate. So you get, I mean, you get all kinds of training, right? Teachers trained in de-escalation stuff. Like my oldest and I do soccer refereeing. They train you in that because soccer parents are crazy. Uh, you know, but... They train you in how to deal with crazy soccer parents. Uh, I got training of that as an auditor, right? How to deal with crazy accountants. They exist. Uh, but over time in Israel, right, what, what worked its kind of way through is if you, it, it didn't like, if you knock my tooth out, then, you know, you got to stand there and, right, I'm going to, it, it developed into this financial compensation system, which is, you know, more or less what our system has developed into too, uh, is that, you know, they, they quantified if, if there was an accident and you lost an eye, you know, it was worth this much and blah, 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 blah. So the principle was really designed to create a system, though, where there are no personal vendettas. Like, that's what it's trying to, to eliminate, is that, that this does not become like this, uh, this culture of just continuously escalating violence. This guy from this village does something to that village, that village, right? And you can see how this would kind of spiral out of control. So God says, no. Right? It's an eye for an eye, it's a tooth for a tooth, it's a hand for a hand, and it was trying to stop that uh, in its tracks. Now, it was not prohibiting you know, police or courts or soldiers or anything like that. All those were somewhat kind of assumed in there. You were not taking justice into your own hands. Justice kind of existed outside of you. There was no vigilante justice. It was justice by uh, by God's people and God's community. So all this is Jesus' teaching is very familiar, right? These people, they wouldn't have batted an eye. They've heard an eye from an eye since they've been, you know, walking around and, and that kind of thing. But Jesus then says, 
but I say to you. And here's where, right, boy, here's where he messes with you, right? Jesus takes us into so much deeper waters, and this is what he does, right? Like this, this law is, and we're going to get into this, man, this law is designed to kind of regulate your behavior. But Jesus says, I want to get underneath that. And I want to change your heart, because if I can change your heart, your behavior will flow out of that. So Jesus changes it. He's not, you know, you've heard an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but Jesus says, do not resist the one who's evil. It's a change. It's an update. Do not resist the one who's evil. Lex talionis, right, is what we call it, is, is another one of those concessions from God. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago when we talked about divorce, right? It's one of these concessions from God, right? Given by God in a, a sin-stained, sin-soaked world uh, where it's just there in order to prevent the effects of what's going on inside of our hearts and inside of our minds from bursting out and overflowing the world in just this river of violence. Is One commentator I read, and he says it very well, he says, God gives this concession, talking about an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, God gives this concession as legal regulation, as a dam against the river of violence which flows from man's evil heart. The law is designed to restrain the behavior. It's meant to obstruct it, to keep the evil that's flowing in from making its out. But Jesus says, that wasn't what my father intended for this to be. To build a dam, just to, to divert it, to, to gather the evil up inside your heart. It was my father's intent for your heart to be changed. For your heart to be renewed. Lex Talionis was an Old Testament principle, but the prophets, right? This the Lex Talionis, back Deuteronomy, back in the law, the prophets... Oh, the prophets looked forward to a different day. The prophets looked forward to a day where the law wasn't written on stone tablets and, and up in the temple, right? And it wasn't just written on paper, but it was written on our hearts. That our behavior wasn't regulated from the outside, but it was changed from the inside. The prophet Jeremiah, talking to Israel 600 years before Jesus says these words. Listen to what Jeremiah says. It's chapter 31, if you want to write it down. Verses 31 through 34. Jeremiah is, is known as the weeping. He's prophesying as Jerusalem is burning from the Babylonians. But Jeremiah says, behold, right, imagine Jerusalem is on fire behind him. People are dying. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke. Though I was their husband, declares the Lord, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each each other, saying, You need to know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least to the greatest, declares the Lord. And I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Jeremiah, as his culture and as his city and as his people were being slaughtered and hauled off into captivity and his capital burning, saw a time and the law wouldn't be needed anymore because it's already written in here, written by God himself on our hearts. And the obedience and the love and the grace and all of it spills out, not as a river of evil that has to be damned, but a river of beauty and joy and goodness. God gave the law to guide his people Israel and to form them but there was always something better coming. Something better than an eye for an eye. Something better than a tooth for a tooth. 
A kingdom of new hearts, a kingdom of soft hearts, a kingdom of hearts that don't need to be instructed by the law, that hearts that don't need their behavior regulated. And what do we see in Jesus? We see him enter onto the scene as we did several months ago and turn to his people and say, repent, the kingdom's at hand. What Jeremiah was talking about, it's here, and it's here with me. And Jesus says, no longer is it an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth and a hand for a hand. Now, it's don't resist the one who's evil. And then he goes on and he says, I know, like, I... I, I I don't claim to be able to, to see into Jesus' thought and mind. That'd be kind of crazy. But, but I, can, I can see into the thoughts and minds of the people sitting around him going, whoa, what does this even look like? Don't resist someone who's evil? And Jesus says, yeah. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Jesus says, you need to have a different kind of humility and love. He's talking about... Uh, talking about an insult, right? If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, here's, here's kind of the visual behind this. Uh, if anyone slaps you, first of all, I mean, let's be honest, that, that's pretty insulting, yes? Right? It's not a punch. A punch is like an assault, and a slap's an insult. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, you, again, we go back, right? The Bible kind of assumes a right-handed world. That means that a right-handed person has come over to the other side and backhanded you, which is a really big insult, right? I mean, let's be honest. That's humiliating. And back in biblical times, first century times, when it's a little bit kind of an honor, shame culture, it was a severe insult, right? It was deeply embarrassing and deeply humiliating. Now, Jesus is not talking about assault. He does not say, you know, if someone stabs you in a spear on your left side, turn to him also your right side. That's not what he's saying. Or if somebody shoots you in your left shoulder, turn to him your right shoulder also, right? Not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, if you are insulted, if someone slaps you on your cheek, Lex Taliana says, what do you do? You slap them back. Human nature says, if someone slaps you on the right cheek, you punch them in the nose. What's kind of driving that response? Your pride. Your pride's hurt. It's embarrassing. And your pride says, you got to respond. But Jesus says, do not return insult for insult. But endure. Accept the ill treatment. Even willingly comply. Turn the other cheek. Allow them to insult you again. Don't respond. Why? Because pride is an ugly, ugly thing. Because Christ wants us not just to restrain ourselves from doing more harm and injecting more evil into the world through retaliation. Instead, Jesus is going to take this a little later in, in Luke records it, but listen what he says. But I say to you who hear, this is Luke 6, 27 and 28. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. We're going to get to that in, in, in our next message in love your enemies. Jesus is saying the kingdom heart is one that does good for evil. That desires good for those that don't desire it for us. Guys, this is not behavior regulation, right? This is heart change. Behavior regulation says, well, maybe I won't hit him back. Heart change says, what good can I do for you? Ooh, deep waters. That's a kingdom perspective right there. Jesus says, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And then he goes on, if, if that punch didn't land hard enough, pun intended, right? Then if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. Jesus espouses this, this radical unselfishness with our property. In ancient times, there were really two garments that were worn. There was the tunic, 
which was really one piece of fabric. And, and, and it's hot in the Middle East for the most part, right? So it usually went down to like mid-thigh, maybe down to the knees. And it came up and covered the torso. And it would come down almost, you know, like my short sleeve shirt is doing, right? And it was really made out of one piece of cloth. Uh, and, and that was your tunic. And then there was an outer garment. Our Bible translates it a cloak, right? Maybe you hung it around your shoulders. Uh, but it was a covering. Sometimes they looked like a poncho. We would call it modern day kind of your coat. Uh, it was considered illegal to take that outer garment. It was what kept you warm at night. You wrapped up in it uh, at home in your blanket, right? It was a prized possession uh, that was actually protected by the law. You could not take, or if you took it during the day, you had to give it back before night fell, right? There were rules around this. But Jesus said, if someone sues you and takes your clothes, now keep in mind, these people did not walk to their closet and open it up and go, what do I want to wear today? They might have had two. Maybe. They probably have one. Jesus says, if they sue you and they take your shirt and your trousers, give them the coat as well. Now, can we be honest? Can we stop here for just a minute and just go, time out. Is this crazy? Like, does this feel kind of feel kind of crazy like like who does that who gives away something that important like this is crazy guys and if you don't see why this isn't just about changing your behavior like like that's not reasonable that's not something that you're going to do maybe you can kind of force yourself to do something if it's really not that valuable to you Okay, okay, yeah, you can have this, sure. There you go, buddy. But this kind of attitude, this kind of change has to come from God. God has got to do some spiritual surgery in order for you to begin to see the world and see people who may be damaging you like this. kind of unselfishness of, of attitude towards possessions. This kind of love of neighbor only comes from a new heart. The kind that Jeremiah was talking about. Kingdom hearts, Jesus followers, we're not just trying to manipulate behavior, right? It's got to take, there's, there's another passage where Jeremiah says that God's just going to remove it, remove that heart of stone that's just hard and put in a heart of flesh. Only a kingdom heart can look at things like this. So he gives you that one. If they would sue you and take your tunic, let them have your cloak. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Jesus says on top of that, you should have a helpful heart. The background of this, Roman occupation. Uh, Rome was the empire of the time. It was huge, huge empire. They'd taken over all kinds of people. And there were rules of being a Roman vassal state. And one of those rules was if a Roman soldier came up to you they could do is a process called commandeering. He could just tap you on the shoulder and go and give you all his gear and force you to walk with him for a Roman mile, which was 3,000 paces, right? Uh, they, could, they could do that to you. They could take your horse. They could take your donkey. They could take your cart. They could take your wagon. They could take anything they wanted. And they could force you to go a couple of miles, or to go, you know, the, the, the 3,000 paces with them. It's called commandeering, like I said. You can imagine it evoked deep resentment and bitterness and spite. People hated it, but there was nothing they could do. There is, no, there is no recourse to this. You cannot go to a court. You cannot appeal to a higher power. Rome owned you. The soldier could force you to carry his gear, and it's the kind of thing that occupiers and oppressors do, and it's the kind of thing that the oppressed and the occupied hate. But listen, you should start to see a change in what Jesus is saying here, because in this one, there's no eye for an eye here. They took an eye, that's it. You took it back, they killed you, right? Right? There's no, there's no balance here. It's like what Rome wanted, Rome took. It's a clue that Jesus is getting into something deeper. Something deeper than just this. If, 
really begin to understand that Jesus is not talking about a new legal model or a better judicial system but, or a better way to dissolve disputes, but instead his teaching is getting kind of down underneath that it's a kingdom heart. That if we can see even unjust practices as opportunities to love, because Jesus says, don't just walk with them for a mile, go two. Now imagine this is, you know, you're in the middle of your work day, right? You're, 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 you're in your fields and this guy just pulls you out and says, no, nah, man, you got to go with me, right? Now you've left your field undone. You've left what, your animals or you know, whatever, right? You're coming home at the end of the day and your family's expecting you home, but nope, some Roman soldier grabs you and goes, hey, you and your cart, you're coming with me. There's nothing you could do. Jesus says, at the end of that 3,000 paces, Go 3,000 more. Bless those that are persecuting you. Give. Even as you are being oppressed, bless your oppressors. I mean, do you see how contrary that is, right? Like our culture, and we'll get into this in just a minute, like oppression is something that has to be fought with every aspect of our being. Jesus doesn't say you shouldn't work to right wrongs, and that's not what he's saying at all. Saying you don't hate and do evil to your oppressors as you do it. Romans 12, 17 through 21, the Apostle Paul kind of picks up on this, if you want to flip there. Romans 12. Paul says, Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what's honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Overcome evil with good. Jesus, he's not washing away the evil. He knows the Roman oppression is evil. He isn't saying that it's not. He's fully recognizing it. He's saying, don't overcome that evil with evil. Overcome it with more good. And that's what the church does over the next three centuries. And the Roman Empire just disintegrates. Overcome it with good, not more evil. And lastly, he says, my people... Don't resist the one who's evil. Give to the one who begs for you. Do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. It's a generous spirit. This free, unselfish attitude towards rights also extends to property. Jesus says, give freely, generously. Now, the idea is not that Christians give away everything they have. One, one commentator has, has a great quote. I'll read it again. It says, there would soon be a class of saintly paupers owning nothing and another of prosperous idlers and thieves. That's not what we're looking at. What Jesus is saying, he's saying that the needs of others become, become your, excuse me, come before your own concern convenience. Jesus is saying, if, if you can give, you should give, even if it hurts. These are challenging, challenging teeth. Like I said, you know, I mean, anger, yep, this, this, that's how anger, murder, right? Divorce, lust, all this. But boy, once you get to these, this one and the next one, so what do you do with this? Okay. Let's make the turn here. What do we do with this? As I thought about this week, I'll, I'll be honest, this is one of the harder messages I've written in a long time because it, it just instinctively my natural it just rejects this. You know what I'm saying? It's like, like trying to come up with examples and, and, and just trying to, to work through like, okay, I've, I've really got to internalize this and absorb this on my own before I can even begin to, to kind of teach this. And I find myself kind of in this space where I would be like, yeah, but... But what about, but you know, uh, okay. And I'm trying to qualify it, you know what I mean? Like, when does this not apply? <laughs> That's the question I kept asking myself. Like, okay, okay. But not here, right? Like, and so here's my first kind of action item for you or life takeaway. Avoid qualifications. I found myself thinking, surely Jesus didn't mean this situation. And surely Jesus didn't mean this situation. And, you know, the more I thought about that, in America, we are a rights-based culture. Uh, you know, rights are to be fought for. The idea of voluntarily giving one up is preposterous. Uh, the idea of turning the other cheek is, is completely foreign, right? The ideas of happily serving and blessing those who oppress you are just crazy talk. 
the idea of even giving generously is, is perhaps a little more apropos for us, but there's a temptation, temptation in my heart, and I'm betting there's a temptation in your heart, to subject this teaching to this endless succession of qualifications. Surely Jesus didn't mean this. Surely just didn't mean in this situation. Surely I shouldn't respond like this. Surely Jesus didn't mean that I should cheerfully, like, sure, you know what I'm saying? Like, there's this temptation to over and over and over again just try to wiggle out of it. And we're tempted to ask. I was tempted to ask this week, okay, what do I have to do? Like, what's required of me in this situation? And what I came to realize in my own heart, perhaps you'll realize it in yours, is that's a very hard-hearted question. What do I have to do? It's a begrudging question. It's a, I don't like this question. This makes me behave. This makes me think. This makes me repent in ways that I really don't want to. But Jesus is saying not... Kyle, don't ask, how far must I go? What must I do? But instead, ask, how far can I go? How much can I do? There are qualifications to this, right? Jesus is talking about personal interactions between you and your neighbor, not necessarily your business or, right? And one commentator uh, really stuck out at me and says, a principled stand for truth and justice is not incompatible with turning the other cheek and perhaps is the vehicle through which the insults come. Right? You can stand for things that are right and wrong. But when the insults start flying, the question is not, uh, how much do I have to do, but how much can I do? And it led me, and, and I, I don't... Here's probably the heartbeat of what I, I, I want you to remember today after this. So if you didn't write anything else down... Write this down. I, I kept asking myself, what are the limits here? What are the limits? What, what, what do I have to do? What do I need to do? Like, what, what's required of me here? But really the only limit here, church, is the limit of love and the limit of word. Capital W. The limit of love and the limit of word. I want to ask, how far do I have, like, make this to where uh, this is not this big open-ended thing, like, Lord, what do I have to do? But Jesus is saying, here are your limits. How much, Kyle, can you love? How deeply can I love in this situation? What does it look like? How is my pride influencing me here? What kind of good can I do here? How do I bring peace and healing and truth into this situation, right? How much can I possibly love? What is my limit? What what is the limit of love in this situation? That's my limit. What is the limit of goodness? But then it's also, what is the limit of God's word? What does it require that I do? What am I prescribed from doing? What does it prevent me from doing? Love opens up this world of possibilities, but if that were the only requirement, we could travel down all kinds of roads and do all kinds of things in the name of love that God would look at and go, that's not really what I was thinking about. It's love and word. The limits of how you react to retaliation, the limits of how much you can give, the limits of whatever it is, is, is that whatever that line is between how can I pour good into this situation, what does God's word require of me and restrict of me, that's the field that's open. Does God's words say it's good? Then I can love and do that. Does God's word say it's not good? then love will not lead me down that road. How does Scripture, what does Scripture have to say about this? How does Scripture say to love people? There's your limit, right? When, when you're wrestling with this, when, when, you're, when you're trying to figure out, Lord, ah, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn them the other. Also, Lord, I want to slap them back. What does love say I can do in this situation? What does God's Word say? There's your limit. But you know, the reality is, is, is you can't do this on your own. You can't do this very naturally. Walking out of here with a conviction to change and to be better is not going to work. It's not going to work. 
the only thing that can precipitate a change like this is a change that's brought on by the cross. I'm going to invite Ezra to come back up. Why the cross? Because the cross is really the only place, church, as he makes his way back up, is the only place where you can see God's justice and God's grace operative at the same time. When Jesus tells you to turn the other cheek, the evil of the slap does not just go away, right? Jesus is not saying that what was done to you is inconsequential. Just suck it up, buttercup. That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is is calling you to endure the impression and to cheerfully do good to the oppressor. But it's not that the evil of that goes away. It does not disappear. Jesus calls you to rejoice and be glad when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on his account. It's not that the evil just disappears. And Jesus is like, our people are people that just have this endless ability to just, just, just take abuse. That's not it. We need to know deep down that justice will be done. We need to know that what happens here to me now doesn't just disappear and I'm not invisible and immaterial and it's not that God doesn't care. God sees. And that eventually, justice will be done. That scripture tells us that every deed, every word that we said, God remembers. And on the cross, we see God say, Here's how you'll know the justice of the cross, all the evil, all the gross, all the sin of every sin ever poured out on Jesus. Perfect justice on somebody that didn't deserve it. But it's there. That's how you know. That's how you know when it happens and and you follow Christ and you let that that word kind of change your heart. That's how you know that this guy doesn't just get away with it in the end, but that God is just. But what we also see at the cross is that God is absolutely and infinitely merciful. Because here's the reality. As oftentimes as not, I'm on the other side of that. I'm the one doing the slapping. I'm the one, you know, whatever. Like, I'm on the other side of that. I've got to know deep down in my heart that that there is justice coming for those, right, that have done this. That also triggers the thought, ah, there's justice coming for me. But the cross tells us, no, it doesn't have to be that way. That Christ died in your place, the just for the unjust, that you might be forgiven. I need to know that. I need to know that that, that God holds right the universe to the, to the utmost standard of justice, but yet God pours his mercy and his grace and his love out on me. And oh, then that triggers the thought and on them too, perhaps, if they come to Christ. Only a heart, church, that really knows that, and I don't mean just knows it here, I mean knows it here, can follow this. Because otherwise, this is crazy. It doesn't make any sense. I don't know where you are today. I struggled with this all week. This was, like I said, one of the more challenging messages I've, I've written in a long, long time. Maybe you need to have that internal conversation with yourself. Maybe you need to, to ask for that heart change. In, in just a moment, I'm going to ask our deacons and deaconesses just to kind of spread out amongst the church. Maybe while, while Ezra sings and leads us in, in one final song of worship here, a song of response, maybe you need to stand and sing like crazy, thank you, Jesus, for the blood, right? Because that's the only thing that keeps me out of that hand of justice. Right? It's the blood of Christ. Maybe you need to just sit and pray. Maybe you need to spread out and find a deacon or deaconess and just talk for a minute. Maybe you need to come up front and kneel and pray. I don't know what it is. I pray that that this weird sense of uh, what's everybody else doing doesn't restrain you. But if you need to pray and you need to talk, like whatever it is, I pray that the Spirit moves in your life. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, in in this time, take this this difficult thing, sink it down deep, God. Bury the foundations way down in our hearts. Lord, let it grow. 
let it grow. Let us see those sprouts and the flowers and the fruit, God. Make us like this individually. Make us like this in families. Make us like this in our church. Make us like this when we go out to our schools and our sport teams and our boats and our offices and homes and wherever we go. Change us, God. Because we can't do this on our own. I pray all this in the wonderful, beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. You guys, please stand, sing, go, pray, whatever it is you need to do today.
You guys be seated. Thank you for being here today, Church Ezra. Thank you for joining us. Great job. Uh, We will be gathering here afterwards. There's coffee hour in the back. Uh, I hope you stay and hang out. It'll be a chance, uh, if you'd like to, to to meet Ezra and to meet Juliana uh, and to chat with them. We'll be uh, doing our members meeting uh, at noon, so we'll ask our church members to hang out uh, afterwards there uh, for a little bit. Um, Thank you. Like I said, thank you for being here. May God bless you. May God keep you. May God make his face to shine upon you. May God be gracious to you. May God give you his peace and pour out his blessings upon you. God bless, and we'll see you next week.